Hello and welcome law firm owners to another episode of the Wildly Successful Law Firm Podcast. I'm your host, Nermeen Jasani, and today we are talking all about lifetime clients and how they are actually the law firm lottery. So before I get into it, just a quick note, last week I gave away a free copy to everyone on my newsletter list, a list of client do's and don'ts, basically a document that helps them manage their client expectations. And because they were on my email list and they had been listeners for a long time, I gave it to them for free. So listen, if you are not already on my newsletter list, go and get on it now. It's very simple. Just go to www.ws-lawyers.com and scroll to the bottom. You will see an option to opt into my newsletter right there and go ahead and opt in so you can get free stuff, of course. And also make sure you stay until the end of this episode because I'm going to be giving you an action plan and a task list of how you can actually get lifetime clients for your law office. So let's talk about lifetime clients. What are they? Why are they like winning the lottery? What is all of this lifetime conversation about? Okay, so a lifetime client, in my opinion, is anyone who works with you multiple times over the period of their life. So here are a few examples. If they're a doctor who's hired you to help them with their divorce, and they've also got children, and they are going to be getting married again, those are three different ways that you can support that one client. Let's say in 2023, you do their divorce. In 2024, you do a child custody modification. Then in 2025, you do a prenup. And that is pretty much the perfect lifetime client for a family law office. Now, that's just one example, and we're gonna go into like specific practice areas through this episode, but a lifetime client is someone who works with you multiple times. If they're a business owner, they have hired your firm to represent all of their legal interests when it comes to their business specifically. So drafting employment contract agreements, then being able to call you to say, hey, we had this situation happen. Is this harassment? You know, What should I do? What should my next steps be here? You're there to advise them for everything that happens in their business. You are general counsel, but general counsel light is what I'll call it. And you're just there to help them with their everyday challenges of being a business owner. Now, having a lifetime client is a lot like winning the lottery because it's rare and it's incredibly valuable, right? This lifetime client, their lifetime value that's the that's the word people use it in business all the time they use it in private equity they use it in um, uh, the tech space ltv the lifetime value the lifetime value of each client needs to be higher than what you want to think about it as as like a one and done you don't want someone to just come to you once and pay you 10 grand or pay you a million dollars you want them to keep coming back to you to increase that lifetime value Think about yourself and your favorite restaurant. You may not go back every single year because it might be a thousand dollar meal when you go back, but you know that over the next 15 anniversaries that you have, birthdays, graduations, divorce celebrations, engagement celebrations, you know that that's going to be one of your go-to restaurants. You are going to be a lifetime client of that restaurant and that restaurant knows that they are building lifetime value in each of their restaurant visits and whoever is coming in to their restaurant they know that they are building an experience that makes people want to come back so that they become lifetime clients so i want you to really think about that analogy through this entire episode Think about your favorite restaurant. Why do you go back? And maybe your favorite restaurant is a pizza shop. It doesn't have to be some fancy restaurant. It can just be the place that you know you frequent often. And what about that experience makes you keep going back and spending money with them? Is it location? Is it convenience? Is it service? Is it food quality? Is it the timeliness of the food, right? Like think about all of these things and 
Just like you can apply it in the restaurant setting, you can apply it inside of your law firm as well when you are trying to increase the lifetime value of your clients. Now, obviously, a lifetime client is different from a one-time client, right? For the obvious reason that the one-time client is only going to work with you once. They're going to hire you for their divorce. They're going to hire you for their T visa. They're going to hire you for their, um, their business merger. And they're never going to hire you ever again. That's a one-time client. They had some experience and based on that experience, they're never going to work with you again. They are a one-time client, okay? Now, why is it so important to have these lifetime clients? This is what I talk about a lot. This is client diversification at its best. So when you look at the buckets of clients that you have, if 100% of your clients are one-time clients, meaning they never come back to you ever, like they're done with you, then that is a problem for you because you're going to constantly be on a new client hamster wheel. You're going to be spending a lot of money on marketing to constantly bring in new clients. So having a client diversification where you have, let's say, 15% one-time clients and then 20% lifetime clients, that is very healthy. I'm not saying that 100% of your clients need to be lifetime clients. Even if you are a uh, business law firm, I'm not saying that that you should only be serving businesses who are only going to work with you every single month for the rest of their business lifetime. I'm certainly not suggesting that. What I am saying is that you need diversification. So some of your clients, at least some, need to be lifetime clients because it's really going to help you give that stability in your practice that allows you to pay your bills, that allows you to grow, that allows you to take care of like the necessary stuff. And then one-time clients and then sometimes repeat clients can just keep your business, like it becomes a cherry on top of everything that's already been established by your lifetime clients. So client diversity, super important. You don't want 100% one-time clients and you don't want 100% lifetime clients but it's going to be a different sort of ratio for different law firms and depending on what kind of practice area you have. So don't copy whatever someone else's is in your industry, create your own to make sure it works for you. Now, let's talk about the variations of a lifetime client. I gave you some examples. If you're a business law firm and you're working with a couple of business owners, you might see more frequency from them. You might see them once a month, twice a month, once a quarter, right? That's very normal for that kind of business practice area to and the frequency of the clients that you're going to see them. But it won't be the same for a family law office, right? So a family law office, like I said, you could see this doctor in 2023 for their divorce, 2024 for the modification, 2025 for the prenup. Now, that's a very different scale. The same could be true for an immigration practice where you might see someone in 2023 to do their uh, their citizenship. And then in 2025, they get married and now they're going to sponsor their partner. And then once they've sponsored their partner, two years later, three years later, they're gonna come in and sponsor that partner's children. So you've got all these variations that you could have inside of the lifetime client analysis, right? It doesn't mean that they're gonna work with you every single year. It doesn't mean that they're gonna hire you every other month. It really depends on your practice area, but I'm giving you these very specific examples so that you can understand what lifetime actually means based on your practice area. Now, there's lifetime clients and there's also lifetime referral partners. Please don't ignore your lifetime referral partners. Here's what this looks like. You could have worked with someone for their immigration application. Maybe they came in and they did an H-1B with you. 
then they were so happy with the support and the timeliness that they are now recommending you to their office, to their HR team, they're recommending you to their other friends who need to get their H-1Bs, they're recommending you to family members who need other types of sponsorship applications and not just H-1Bs. So all of this being said, that one person who you did that really great H-1B for is now going to refer you to other people. They become a lifetime referral partner for you. And next week, you want to listen in because I'm going to be talking a lot about networking and how to build these lifetime referral relationships. But when it comes to these lifetime clients, let's talk about how you can identify them as a law firm owner. Basically, if this client has paid you on time and they were nice and easy to work with, they were responsive, they never called your staff, yelled at them, they never sent you a nasty email, they weren't like, hey, I need to see this person today, nothing has moved on my case, I need to know what's happening, none of those people are gonna be qualified because they've already got this bitter taste about their experience of working with you. It's going to be less likely that they are going to come back to you once they've had that bitter taste. So, this lifetime client is anyone who has paid you on time and was nice. Paid you on time. Okay, these are two different things. They paid you and they paid on time. Not they paid you after you sent them 15 emails and seven follow-up requests. No, they paid you on time, okay? All right, how do you actually develop a relationship with this lifetime client? How, so you've identified them, you know that they paid you on time and they were, they were kind to work with, they were a good client. Now, how do you develop that? So what you wanna do is you wanna nurture them through trust, communication, and consistent quality. Okay, that means a lot of things for a lot of law firm owners, but I wanna be very specific here. Consistency is unbelievably important when it comes to client relations. And if you are someone who doesn't respond until sometimes you respond in 24 hours, sometimes you respond after a week and a half, sometimes you respond in 48 hours, like that's not creating consistent quality. If you're training a whole bunch of new people on your team, and one time they're working with your super experienced paralegal, then another time they're working with a newbie, then another time they're working with you. There's so much inconsistency there that they can't actually build trust with you. This is why I tell, especially women-owned law firms, don't grow so fast because these are the relationships that you need to be able to keep. And if you can't keep these relationships with your clients, they're not gonna send you referrals and they're not gonna come back to you. If you keep making them feel like they're being tossed around, it's not a warm and welcoming feeling. Again, go back to that restaurant that you frequent, that you love, that you are willing to go to you know, 10 years from now. Think about what makes it at that restaurant that makes you want to keep coming back. And then ask yourself, are you doing that with your own law firm clients to help build them into lifetime clients for you? Are you actually nurturing them? Are you doing things like gifting and client appreciation events? I will tell you that when it comes to gifting, go back to last season, I have an entire episode on gifting. It is unbelievably important when I work with my clients on automating their law firm, I make sure that we build gifting into the automation process, which is they've signed on, they've signed a contract, they've made a payment, and now we're going to automatically send them a gift. And this happens like instantaneously, like all of these things are happening at once. And the ease and convenience that that creates for clients is incredible because what happens with a lot of law firm owners is they'll say oh yeah my team can handle it but then the team gets busy and then the team gets team forgets to do it and now you've got a strategy of gifting that's not being executed so we make sure that that doesn't happen the other thing is 
Client appreciation events are incredibly important. They really help your clients feel connected to you as one of their clients, as, as one of the people that they've spent money with. And the thing that I want you to remember is, especially if your clients are all around the country, if they are international, like it's gonna be hard to do a client appreciation event for someone who's not here, but there are ways that you can still make them feel like they have access to you and that they are appreciated by you. So again, gifts, reaching out to them, calling them, hey, how are you doing? How are things going? Where are you stuck right now? Like, what can I help you with? All of these little things help build the trust and the quality that makes them wanna keep coming back to you. Okay, so there's a lot of challenges that you're probably gonna experience when it comes to building lifetime clients. Yeah, part of the problem is you're not gonna be able to easily identify them because this, is a, this isn't something you've ever thought about before. You're really looking at this from a different lens. Now, the other challenges that you're gonna have is you're going to, at some point, try to hand this work off, try to hand your work off to another attorney or to another paralegal and they're gonna fuck it up. They're gonna do something that is going to make that client not wanna work with you again. And the fact that they are working with you through this process is only because they've signed a contract and made a payment, but something has happened along the way and they are no longer happy with you or your team. What they were promised, they are no longer getting. They thought that they were gonna work with you, but instead they're only working with a new paralegal who is making errors in spelling their name and their address and things like that. I will tell you that years ago, I worked with a business attorney to work on something for one of my clients. And in the first line of the contract, the business name was spelled incorrectly and the address was incorrect. Based on those two things, I, I never worked with that attorney ever again. And not only that, but I, I'm shocked that stuff like that still happens, but I also know that that attorney handed off that contract to someone else because when, you look, when I looked on um, Microsoft Word to see who made the comments, it was someone else's initials. It was not the attorney's initials who I had hired. So I really just want you to keep in mind, like you're gonna try to hand this off to someone and they're going to fuck it up and you wanna be really mindful of who you hire. And you wanna make sure that they not only have the skill set, because I see a lot of attorneys focusing on skill, but they're not focusing so much on the softness, the EQ of this person that they're hiring. And if you are in a very sensitive practice area, like immigration or family law or estate planning, and you have someone who's just a hard ass on the phone, who's just like, this document was due yesterday, where is it? You are, are not gonna get them back as a lifetime client. You can say goodbye. So who you hire is fundamental in determining how many of your clients are going to become lifetime clients. And if you are an attorney who's trying to find cheap instead of like skills and softness, you're gonna have this problem and you're not gonna have people who want to work with you. So I really want you to be mindful of all of this as you are handing off these tasks and these clients to other people on your team. You've gotta make sure that they are carrying them, themselves as, at least to, at the same level that you are. They're not gonna carry themselves better than you are because it's not their law firm, it's not their practice but they need to be able to do at least, at least a little bit. Okay, here's the other challenge that you might have with a lifetime client that I know a lot of my clients have told me. Once they become a lifetime client, they feel bad increasing their prices. So whatever their price was, whatever they were charging every hour for this business owner client in 2022, they won't up the prices for 2024 because they're scared. This has been a lifetime client. They're scared to increase prices. They're all in their head about it. I completely understand that, but you have to increase your prices. Otherwise, they're not going to value you. And there is a format of a letter that you can send to them 
that's about how you are going to increase prices. And you can also extend generosity. You can say, look, I'm increasing prices across the board for 2024. Because you've been a longtime client of mine, I'm only going to increase them starting in June of 2024 or starting in Q2 of 2024, or I will bill the first 10 hours at this initial rate, and then after that, it will be at the new rate, or I will bill for the first five hours at you know 250 an hour, and then after those five hours, it's gonna be at the normal rate. You can absolutely increase prices for your lifetime clients. Please do not be scared to. They're not gonna leave you, they're not gonna go away, they've built trust with you, and if anyone leaves you for like a difference of a couple hundred dollars, they're probably not a lifetime client that you wanna grow with, right? Like these lifetime clients, especially if they're business owners, like you wanna be able to grow with them. And that means as their needs increase and they go from needing you five hours a month to now 15 hours a month, that they understand that there is value that's being given there. And the value isn't just in your expertise, my friend. Your value is in the fact that they get to access you. For some reason, attorneys always overlook that. And once you have a lifetime client, you are giving them access to you, not 24 seven, but that you will respond like in 12 hours. I will tell you what I do with my lifetime clients, my VIP clients, is they go into a separate inbox in my overall email inbox. And when I see an email from a VIP client or for someone who's a lifetime client, I respond to those emails first. I don't respond to, to other people's emails unless they hit that inbox. So there are definite benefits that you can help them understand when you increase prices on them. And I don't want you to feel like, okay, I can't increase prices They're a lifetime client. They didn't become a lifetime client at a lifetime price. They became a lifetime client of your firm and will grow with you as your firm grows. So keep that in mind. Next, one of the other biggest challenges that you're gonna have is you don't have time. You don't have time to work with all of these clients. How are you supposed to prioritize them over other people? And I totally get it. This is where I need you to realize that there's a sweet spot in your firm. And if you have too many clients, you're going to burn out and be exhausted. And the solution isn't to hire more people, it's to increase your rates and then see who sticks around. But when you get to a point where you are saying, I don't have time for my lifetime clients, pause. Really ask yourself, I don't have time for a $50,000 client but I'm gonna make time for a $200 consult? That sounds absurd, doesn't it? And yet I see lawyers doing this shit all the time. They will hand off their really good clients to shitty paralegals and to other shitty attorneys. And I don't mean they're shitty, they're just not as trained. They just don't know everything that you know. And they'll just hand it off and they won't even work on it. And then when that lifetime client leaves and they wonder what happened, that's exactly what happened. That client got tired of subpar service from your office. And that comes back to you, right? So you've got to find time to, to nurture these lifetime clients as they continue to work with you. You cannot just hand them off. Now, the final challenge that you're going to have, and this is the biggest one, you're not aware you have no idea who your lifetime clients are. You have no idea where they came from. You have no idea how they found out about you. You don't even know who they are. You just, you don't know. You don't know their first name. You don't know their last name. You don't know what they spent with you. You don't know. And that's a challenge. That's a problem. You're not taking the time to pause every month to look back to see what happened okay, I had 10 new clients, four of them came from Bob Smith, two came from Priya Patel, right? You're not going through and doing that because you're so busy being in your law firm that you're not taking that bird's eye view that's necessary as a CEO. Okay, so I'm hoping that this is all urging you to go and make the time 
and figure out who these people are, especially as we're coming ar uh, around the holidays right now. Hopefully you've got some downtime to be able to really think about these things and to really think about, okay, who are my lifetime clients? Who are my potential lifetime clients? Who do I want to work with? Who could I potentially make a deal to to say, hey, this is what we can do? Okay, so this gets us into the next part of this conversation, which is how do you get them? How do you get these lifetime clients? Okay, so if you are a business law firm owner, I need you to stop thinking of yourself as Uber on demand. Here's what that means. Business law firm owners, you guys are notorious for only working with people for one contract, one business formation, one, one thing. Pause, if they just established a new business, guess what? They're probably gonna need an attorney to review the lease agreement. They're probably gonna need the attorney to review a, a supplier agreement. They're probably gonna need an attorney to draft a contractor agreement, right? Like there's all these ways that you can come in and support them, but you keep thinking of yourself as Uber on demand and they'll call me when they need me. Stop that. Think of yourself as a GC light. What can you offer to this business owner who just set up their business, was willing to pay you, was very polite, didn't complain once, and now has a business? And maybe it's a medical practice. And you can stop and say, hey, I can support you through the phases of your medical practice. I would recommend starting with a general employment agreement. Can I draft that for you? Here's what it'll cost. And it will, it will, it will cost this, but it's going to prevent at least $30,000, $50,000 in complaints or future issues. How do you feel about that? They're probably gonna say, yes, please do draft that agreement. I'm absolutely willing to pay $1,500, $2,500, $3,500 for a draft of an employment agreement that I can use for all of the people who are gonna come and work with my medical office. Now, once we're done with that, do you think we can do, you know, can you review my HIPAA privacy policy? Sure, I can absolutely do that. Do you see how that works out? It's got to be you stepping out of your own mindset of they're going to call me when they need me and just offering your services to them. GC Light. That's what I want you to keep thinking about. Okay, next. How do you get lifetime clients for an immigration office? Okay, immigration. There's so much that's out of your control. You don't control how quickly the client gets documents over to you. You don't control how quickly the um, immigration office is going to process the application. You don't get to control how quickly they're going to make a decision. Some of these cases can be dragged out for three years, five years, 10 years. We all know the, the very long timelines when it comes to immigration. Now, your job is to do an A plus job at the things that you can control in your office. So if they're gonna have an appointment, make sure it's confirmed. Make sure they know where they're going. When they get there, make sure your person in the office, your admin, your receptionist knows, hi, Mr. Jasani, how are you doing today? We're really excited to see you. Not, hi, okay, I'll be right with you. Like no one needs that experience. They need to feel like it's a very personalized experience, like you know them, like you care about them, that you are here for them, that your entire office is dedicated for them. They need to feel that way. It's not going to be true in fact, but they need to be made to feel that way. And technology can help with a lot of that. Calendly can help with a lot of that. There's a lot of tools out there that can make your clients feel like, oh, she cares about me. Like she is, she's definitely there for me. I like the offices where the team reaches out to the client and the client doesn't have to check in with the team to say, hey, what's the status of my application? No, you should be sending an email to that client, a text message to that client. Hi, this is so-and-so from the Jasani Immigration Office. Just wanted to let you know that there's no update with your case, but we are monitoring it. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. When I say stuff like that to most people, they're like, oh my God, do you know how many more people are gonna call in if we say that? It's all about communication. So if you say at the bottom of that, no action is necessary in whatever language that your clients are speaking, I promise that is actually going to stop more phone calls from coming in than more phone calls coming in because you've told them exactly what to do in that 
text message, in that email, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, let's move on to family offices. So we've talked about them a little bit before that, you know, if you've got someone who's coming to you for a divorce, that they also stay with you for a child custody modification and that they come back to you for a future prenup. All of these things are valid for a family office. And the most important thing I can say about this is whoever's on your team needs to be soft and empathetic. I've seen way too many family offices with people who are not nice with a team that's not polite, that's very short, that's very like, okay, well, I, you, that's not how this is gonna go, click. You know, just being very impatient. And for this practice area specifically, you need to make sure that you're hiring for softness and for EQ. So if you've got good people, that's really gonna help you. And of course, gift at the beginning is very nice and doing client appreciation events for these family, um, family law attorneys. Okay, let's talk about estate planning. The most important thing I can say with estate planning is this. You ask 7,000 questions. Where's the property? What are the kids' names? What are their ages? Who's gonna be the executor? You ask all of these questions and then you shoot yourself in the foot by not asking the business development question, the question for future clients and future referrals, which is, hey, this person who's listed in this will, your mother, your sister, et cetera, et cetera, do they have a will? You don't make the ask of the people who are already mentioned in that will. You just sit there and assume that people are going to wake up one day and feel like, oh, okay, I think I'll do my will today. This is a good idea. Or you wait for the referral to come in from the insurance agent or from the you know CPA or the financial planner. Like you wait for the business to come in instead of going out and seeking it for yourself. And if you can develop this as a habit, you're going to have a lot more lifetime referral partners than you are gonna know what to do with. Because everyone in your office is gonna say, hey, okay, so here's this document. There's a sister and a brother who's listed. Let's make sure that these two people also have a will. And if they agree to work with us, if both of them agree, we can do like a combined $200 discount as a courtesy to the client who agreed to work with us. That's totally okay. There's a few ways that you can even do this. You can either ask in the meetings and then you've got to take that information then you've actually got to be able to reach out to them. So you've got to be able to say, okay, well, here's my business card. Please pass this on to them. Another thing that you can do is you can draft an email and say, hey, we'd love to work with your sister and your brother. I noticed that you, know, you said that they don't have a will. Here's an email that you can send to them. And then if they schedule with us, we'll be more than happy to um, give them that discount. So here's the email. And it says word for word, hi, this is so-and-so from so-and-so law office. We worked with your sister on this will. We'd love to work with you. If you would like, you can schedule a consult with us and then we can make sure that you are fully protected as well. You gotta make the ask. You gotta stop waiting for business to come to you. You gotta stop waiting for people to just refer business. You gotta go out and get it for yourself. And if you are able to do that, lifetime clients are gonna happen. Okay, so now here's your action plan. We're at the end of this episode. Here is the one thing I want you to do, okay? You might be able to do this in your head. You might need to do this in a note on Apple. Just try not to use a pen or paper because pen and paper tend to get lost. I want you to just ask yourself, identify for yourself, who are your repeat clients in your business? You might have four, you might have seven, you might have 10. You don't know until you stop and ask yourself and start making the list of who's worked with you multiple times, okay? Next question, identify the people who sent you that repeat client. So let's say you've got Star Jones and Star Jones has worked with you four times since 2018 figure out who sent Star Jones to you. That's all you need to do. You're gonna identify your lifetime clients and then you're gonna identify the source of that lifetime client. And you're going to start to see patterns in this. You're going to start to see, oh wow, three of those people came from my church. 
hmm, or four of those people came from the gym, or two of those came from law school buddies. Oh, I have not thanked those law, law school buddies. I have not met up with those law school buddies and they have sent me business, right? Okay, so that's everything for this episode. Make your action plan. Make sure you listen in next week because I'm talking all about networking and how important it is for you to build relationships that last for your law firm. That's everything for this episode. I hope you're having a great holiday season and tune in next week and make sure you sign up for the newsletter. Thanks, lawyers.